So what is reframing? <clears throat> reframing is the reassignment of annotation for a given lexical unit from its frame to a different frame as a result of a better and more fine-grained analysis of the original frame and its lexical units. <clears throat> <clears throat> Reframing requires new frames, each with its own set of frame elements and lexical units, to be defined. The, <clears throat> an entire lexical unit, including all of its annotations, can be reassigned to a different frame. As I suggested earlier, sometimes that happens because FrameNet failed to take into consideration a criterion that was important for the analysis of one or more of the lexical units assigned to a frame. In order to have a better understanding of reframing, we need to talk about annotation set. An annotation set includes all of the labels applied to a given sentence with respect to exactly one lexical unit in that sentence. Reframing was developed in the context of lexicographic annotation. So when reframing happens, it involves moving the annotations for one lexical unit in the sentence in which it occurs. <clears throat> An annotation set includes the triple of information that comprises frame element, grammatical function, and phrase type layers, as well as other information provided on other layers, such as special sentence type. Yesterday, I showed you what you see in the FrameNet desktop when we have a sentence that we recognize as a metaphorical use of a lexical unit. We indicate that it's a, metaf it's a metaphor. Until now, FrameNet hasn't done anything with anything special with those sentences. There's a new project at uh, ICSI in which FrameNet is involved, the metaphor project, and that may serve as the vehicle for FrameNet to do some further analysis of those sentences that we've indicated as metaphor. <clears throat> Another piece of information that gets reframed when a sentence is reframed is whether or not there are any supports in that sentence. I showed you some screenshots of the different layers that the lexicographer can and does see when annotating. On one of those layers, there's the um, possibility of indicating whether some uh, constituent or piece of a constituent in a sentence that's being annotated has some support element. 
If you remember a few days ago, we talked about support elements that require special kinds of annotation in FrameNet. That information is reframed along with the other information for a single lexical unit in a sentence. Let's look at an example of reframing that actually took place in FrameNet. The sentences <clears throat> that you see are all about noise, right? The siren blasted exactly at noon. The foreman blasted the siren exactly at noon. The stock car blasted down the track. In each of these sentences, the lexical unit under consideration is blast. And the question, of course, is, <clears throat> are these example sentences instances of a f exactly one frame? Or are there several frames? So in the, in the course of studying these kinds of noise lexical units, we determined that we needed many more frames than we initially had. The important thing to note here is that the frame that we initially called noise was renamed, not reframed, renamed to make noise. It also involved revising some of the definitions, some of the frame element definitions, and so on. <clears throat> Once we renamed the frame to make, to become, make noise, rather than noise, we also understood that we had many more frames to characterize for the sentences that had initially all been annotated from the perspective of make noise. And here are the names of the frames that were involved. Cause to make noise, as in the foreman blasted the siren exactly at noon. There's an agent causing something to happen. It stands to reason that we would name that frame cause to make noise. <clears throat> We have motion noise. The stock car blasted down the track. So the noise comes with, or as a consequence of, the motion. Sound movement, <clears throat> loud rock music from the radio blasted through the window, right? So the sound is moving. And then sounds. The blast of the siren woke everyone up. <clears throat> if you go to the FrameNet website, you can learn more about all of the details of each of these frames. What's relevant here is that we started with one frame. We understood that we needed many frames. We didn't want to waste the annotation that had already been done for the sentences that had been in what became known as the make noise frame. We reframed the sentences. I'm going to show you <clears throat> what that looks like 
in the FrameNet desktop. This is a picture of the FrameNet desktop opened to start the reframing mapping process. <clears throat> On the left-hand side, you see what we call the frame tree, a long list of frame names. <clears throat> you can select a frame action menu, and from that, get the relations menu, which includes a list of all possible relations currently recorded <clears throat> in the FrameNet database. And then, once you select your relation, you, you, you call up a relation editor, which allows you to choose which relation you're going to add or which relation you might change. In our case, we're going to select <clears throat> uh, reframing mapping. On the left-hand side, you see the original frame, make noise. On the right-hand side, you see the cause to make frame. When I, see, when, I said, when I say you see the frame, I'm actually, what I actually mean is you see a list of the frame elements in each of the frames. And you are going to then decide how to map the frame elements from the original frame onto the frame elements in the new frame, right? <clears throat> Obviously, the new frame has to have already been created. It has to have been defined. Frame definition, frame element definition, what are the lexical units, all the things that we ordinarily do <clears throat> in creating a frame. It has to have already happened before any reframing can happen. <clears throat> Here you see the frame element mapping editor. <clears throat> the software provides default mappings automatically. And of course, the lexicographer can make changes. So the software, as we all know, is stupid. It will provide mappings between frame elements in one frame to the other frame because maybe they have the same name or a very similar name, right? But the job of the lexicographer is to check what was provided automatically and make changes as necessary, much the same way as when um, uh, doing frame element annotation on a sentence, the software provides, uh, automatically provides grammatical function and phrase type, and the lexicographer checks to see if it's correct, and if not, makes the appropriate changes. Now we're gonna go into the <clears throat> frame element uh, editor, uh, the relation editor, in which the mappings are going to be created. So the uh, remapping, reframing mapping has to be done one frame at a time, and obviously one frame element to the appropriate frame element in, in the next frame. On the right-hand side of this um, picture of the FrameNet desktop, 
uh, of the relationship editor in of the relation editor in the FrameNet desktop. You see all the new frames, right? And the frame that's in the center of the screen is the original frame, right? So as we already can surmise, given the sentences I showed you at the beginning, there are many frames involved in the reframing of noise-related words. Originally, they were all in one frame. We understood the words better. We did the research. We looked for good examples in the corpus. And we came to understand that we needed several more frames. We want to reframe the sentences that have already been annotated and, so to speak, live in the original frame to the new frame. <clears throat> FrameNet also keeps a record of the reframing. So we know that the reframing of make noise required the creation of new frames, the, uh, the, the creation of the mappings from the frame elements in the original frame to the new frame, to each new frame as appropriate, and we keep a record of it. We <clears throat> are not making any claim about frame-to-frame -frame relations between the original frame and the newly created frame to which the appropriate example, uh, the appropriate annotated example sentences have been reframed. You can think of this type of work as more about the technical apparatus that facilitates exploiting existing annotated sentences rather than throwing them out and starting over again. As I'm sure you understand by now, manual annotation is a very labor-intensive effort, and we want to make the maximum use of everything that results from that work. Michael um, has a comment. Yeah, just to, to point out, um, much to our surprise, some people have used this information uh, for inferencing purposes. And uh, have <laughs> despite, even- Despite the disclaimers. Despite the disclaimers, and they get some use out of it. We'll talk about that uh, right. later on uh, when I'm talking about using FrameNet for uh, natural language processing and things like that. <clears throat> I want you to notice that we'll see this interface or this type of interface again when we discuss the real frame-to-frame relations. FrameNet uses the same technical apparatus to record the real frame-to-frame -frame relations. <clears throat> FrameNet made a lexicographic decision to systematically distinguish among causatives, encoatives, and statives, <clears throat> each category of lexical unit in a separate frame. So the first example I showed you was, OK, we, we dumped, if you will, all the lexical units that had some sense of, make, of noise into one frame. And then we understood we need to do a more 
fine grain analysis. To a certain extent, that as well as the next example that I'll show you are lexicographic decisions. Um, this particular lexicographic decision is one that um, uh, uh, derives from the well-known fact that there are many, many instances across the vocabulary of English, and I imagine in other languages, including Portuguese as well, <clears throat> uh, between causative, inchoative, and stative. That's a distinction that you find across the vocabulary. <clears throat> so FrameNet made the decision to uh, distinguish among that category or those categories of meanings in, by having each in, a, in its own frame. And this makes sense given FrameNet's um, principle of uh, dividing up senses of a word by frame. It's in perfect alignment with what FrameNet does. <clears throat> Here are some examples from English <clears throat> that illustrate the semantic distinction of causative Encoative and stative in the vocabulary. <clears throat> you can have a transitive verb such as kill. He killed the rat. An encoative verb as illustrated in this sentence, the rat died, where the verb is intransitive, the verb die is intransitive, and the adjective dead. I found the rat dead, or the dead rat was on the floor. Okay? <clears throat> that happens to be a particularly interesting example because unlike the others you see on this chart, kill is a totally different uh, lexeme, if you will, from die and dead. But nevertheless, that is, kill is the causative of die. <clears throat> on this chart you see <clears throat> the frames that FrameNet has defined that capture the causative, encoative, stative distinction. <clears throat> and here we have more of those frames. This morning we're going to look at the triple of frames attaching, encoded attaching, and being attached. <clears throat> we already know a lot about attaching. Maybe we know too much, but <laughs> we're certainly familiar with attaching. Just as a reminder, <clears throat> The attaching frame is defined as an agent attaches an item to a goal <clears throat> by manipulating a connector, creating an asymmetric relationship between the item and the goal. Alternatively, <clears throat> the agent attaches two items to each other where each serves as the goal for the other. Remember? He tied my hands together. He tied the horse to the post. 
Asymmetric is the latter, is the former. Symmetric is he tied my hands together. Some of the lexical units in this frame, in addition to the now very famous tie, we have attach, affix, anchor, bid, singe, fasten, and so on. And you see here a good example of asymmetric attaching and symmetric attaching. David fastened his press pass to his lapel with a hairpin. The agent instantiated by David, his press pass illustrates the item to his lapel is the goal, and with a hairpin is the connector. Asymmetric attaching. Symmetric attaching, a day worker fastened the planks together, <clears throat> where a day worker instantiates the agent, the planks instantiates the items, and together instantiates the result. Now let's look at encoative attaching. An item comes to be attached to a goal, forming a bond between the item and the goal, or two items come to be attached to each other. Some of the lexical units in encoative attaching include agglutinate, attach, bind, fasten, more, take hold. And a good example of encoative attaching is the following sentence. Through the snorkel mask, she saw the tentacle fasten around her ankle. The tentacle is the item. Around her ankle is the goal. And finally, being attached. An item is attached by a connector to a goal, or two items are attached to each other. Some of the lexical units in the being attached frame include affixed, attached, bound, fastened, hooked, and so on. A couple of example sentences <clears throat> of uh, being attached. The stick is fastened to his leg with a heavy rope. The stick instantiates the item. To his leg is the goal. And with the heavy rope is the connector. Symmetric being attached. The planks were fastened together, where the items is instantiated with the noun phrase, the planks, and together instantiates a, a non-core frame element that we call dependent state. We're back in the uh, relations editor. In the center of the screen, uh, you see the attaching frame. On the right-hand side, you see encoative attaching.
and you see the frame element mappings between the attaching frame and the encoded attaching frame. What you need to know is that the kinds of sentences that I showed you for illustrating the three frames had all originally been annotated within the attaching frame. Once FrameNet understood that we needed to make that sense semantic distinction across the board, we took advantage of the existing annotations and moved them, if you will, to other frames. Now, obviously, the, the sentences weren't moved anywhere. They remained in the database exactly where they had been when they were annotated originally, but their connections changed. The annotation set for each sentence that was reframed was now associated with the new frame rather than the original frame, right? All of the sentences that FrameNet extracts from the corpus to consider for annotation live in the database, regardless of whether or not they have been annotated. The annotated ones are associated with the frames, the frame elements, the lexical units, and all the other semantic information relevant for that sentence annotated in that frame. They're associated with each other. <clears throat> Here's a depiction of the frame element mapping for um, the frame elements in attaching and the frame elements in inchoative attaching. Notice that there is no mapping from agent in the attaching frame to anything in the encoded attaching frame, right? Given what we know as the meaning difference between a causative and an encoative, we're not surprised that there's no mapping between agent and anything in the encoded attaching frame. We can look at a screenshot of the relation between encoded attaching and being attached, where we see <clears throat> the frame element mappings and notice that result in the encoded attaching frame corresponds to nothing in the being attached frame. And the frame element dependent state in being attached corresponds to nothing in the encode of attaching frame. Again, given the semantic distinction between encode of attaching and being attached, we're not surprised each of these frame elements has no correspondent in the other frame. <clears throat> A frame net analysis of causative, encoative, and stative words includes a separate entry for each LU of the triple, a valence description for each lexical unit, and access 
to annotated example sentences. We're going to look at valence descriptions for each category of word and notice the differences. First, the valence description of the word fasten, fasten in the attaching frame. <clears throat> Notice that the transitive verb has the FE agent in its valence description, along with other related frame elements, such as means and purpose, right? Only an event that requires an agent can possibly have a frame element such as means, because means is the means by which someone accomplishes something, right? Here are some example sentences. <clears throat> People were fastening a rope to a great elm tree. The topmost sentence. Notice that a rope in the first sentence is an instantiation of the item. And on the second layer of annotation, we've indicated that it's also the connector. In the uh, last sentence on the slide, the very bottom sentence, he fastened his cloak round his shoulders, which actually illustrates the same uh, pattern we have an agent, he, his cloak as the item, round his shoulders as the goal, and on the second layer of annotation, his cloak is also the connector. Is there a question? Monica, you look troubled. Is the question about second layer annotation? OK, hold that thought. I want to get through these, and then we'll come back. <clears throat> Here's the valence description for fasten in the encoative attaching frame. And here are the sentences. Let's look at the first one. The cheetah's jaws fasten on the gazelle's throat, and it is quickly throttled to death. Where the cheetah's jaws instantiates the item, on the gazelle's throat instantiates the frame element goal, and on the second layer, the cheetah's jaws also instantiates the connector. <clears throat> Lastly, we're looking at the valence table for fastened in the being attached frame. And we're going to look at uh, two example sentences. So let's uh, look at the second sentence. Doug's rod is fastened to his wrist with a leather strap like a manilin wallet. Doug's rod is the item. To his wrist is the goal. And with a leather strap is the connector. Only the valence description of the transitive verb includes the, et, the frame element agent, as well as other related frame elements, 
should they actually be instantiated in the sentence. Thus, distinguishing, attaching from both inchoative attaching and being attached. FrameNet data helps differentiate, to some extent, the intransitive verb fasten from the stative adjective fastened. Inchoative attaching allows different kinds of non-core frame elements than are found with being attached. <clears throat> to summarize what we've talked about for reframing, reframing is a tool that facilitates reassignment of annotated sentence to more semantically fine-grained frames which don't necessarily bear a frame-to-frame -frame relationship. In the case of the causative, inchoative, and stative frames, they do bear a frame-to-frame -frame relationship, and we'll talk about that, or those frame-to-frame -frame relationships tomorrow. In the, in the noise-related frames, there are either none or a variety. So it's not always as systematic as it might appear from just looking at uh, the causative, inchoative, and stative frames. Reframing is used in the service of sense discrimination in keeping with FrameNet's principle of a, 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 a single sense of a lemma and a frame constituting a lexical unit. Reframing implements a lexical semantic concept that also has consequences for lexicography as with the causative, inchoative, and stative example with attaching, inchoative attaching, and being attached. Thank you. Now, Monica had a question about these. Uh, a rope as uh, the item and the rope as the connector. Yes. Uh, it's okay. Yes. But the cloak as the connector, I can't get it. <laughs> OK. Just. Uh, so uh, one possible answer uh, is that this is wrong. Um, that's, that's, no, no, that's, that is one possible answer. So um, the sentence is technically ambiguous. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, if, if it's fastened in the way that a cloak is normally fastened with a brooch or something like that, then this is incorrect. Because then the, that would be a separate frame element the, with a brooch. Whether you say it or not, doesn't matter. You know, there, there would be a null instantiation of, uh, of the... Connector. Of the connector, yeah. Uh, so that's one possible interpretation. Uh, however... It's also possible that the cloak is sort of, so to speak, tied to itself. Um, so uh, that's, I'm not saying, I would have annotated it the way you were, you were saying. <coughs> However, uh, I just point out that the sentence is technically ambiguous. And right. in cases where, for example, if I say, uh, you know, she tied the sweater around her waist, it's clear. Then it's very clear that the sweater should be both the, uh, the item that's attached and <clears throat> the connector. Right. I um, think the other point to make is the one that Michael made earlier about prototypicality. So um, it's easy to see that a rope or a belt fits into our understanding of what a prototypical connector is. I think it's a little more difficult to see that for a cloak, because we don't think of cloaks as rope-like entities. 
Nevertheless, as someone who often walks around with a sweater either uh, tied over my shoulders and tied or around my waist, in that situation, the sweater is just as much of a connector as a rope or a belt, right? Okay, I thought you were gonna ask a question about how we determine uh, which is the first level layer and which is the second layer, right? I thought, you I thought your question was gonna be, how did you decide that a rope is primarily the item and on the second layer, the connector. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is a good question. <laughs> uh, did you want, did you want no, me to talk, to talk about that? <coughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so uh, we do have a, I think Miriam may have mentioned this before, but it, it bears repeating, uh, I think. Um, so in general, how uh, we decide which frame element to put on the first layer is basically what you can call the non-defeasible part of the annotation. So defeasible in logical terms means if I added some more material to the sentence or changed the sentence in some minimal way, um, which of these frame element assignments would have to remain? So that would be the, in, so to speak, indefeasible inference. from. So if I said um, they were fastening a rope to a great elm tree with another rope, <laughs> or, so, or with uh, a nail, right? Now this with a nail would actually specify the connector, right? right? So we can actually see that this sentence could even mean that, right? And the connector could be null instantiated, right? So effectively, the, the fact that the, the, the rope in this sentence is an item is not defeasible. Right, so it's definitely there's some uh, you know non move somewhat non movable relationship between the rope and and the tree, um, but whether or not the rope is used as the thing that causes the immobility, we can't tell for sure from this. However, we can infer that the most reasonable interpretation of the sentence is that the rope is also the connector. And so anytime we have a second layer annotation, it's always like that. It's always an inference. Although often it's an inference which is really strong. So in this case, I would say, you know, this is the, the really is the only example. reasonable. This is a good example. It's a good of example. A really the only reasonable inference. Uh, the, I mean, the only examples I can think of that are stronger are the ones that uh, Chuck Fillmore uh, mm. brought up many years ago about curing a leper, mm. um, where, okay, I mean, it is technically possible that you could cure the leper of her blindness, but if you said that you cured the leper, of course you would infer that the disease was leprosy, right? <laughs> You would right. not think that it was something else. Uh, right. So it's a very it's a very strong inference in that case, but it's still an inference. So we put it on the second layer. Right. Okay. So are there any more questions? Yes, Ellie. I want to know if uh, the same analysis was done with the verb uh, break that uh, we are discussing here earlier. Ah, that is. But. Uh, uh, Are you asking if we? I don't. I don't know about a frame being break, being broken. Right. For example. Right. Are you asking about the evolution of the break frames, or are you asking um, about something else? <laughs> if the because, same. Because, because. Um, Although I'm not positive, my recollection is that by the time we got to break and its related uh, LU, lexical units, 
we had already figured out that we need to split more than we had split early on. So rather than throwing all the break-related words into one big frame, annotating lots of examples, and then going, uh-oh, we need to fix that, <laughs> and having to do all the reframing, we started with the understanding that there are many senses here. It's in FrameNet's best interest to keep those senses separate, given that we're, in general, inclined to the splitting end of things. So we didn't have to go through lots of reframing. It's always possible that in doing some data check, we discover that a sentence that was annotated in cause to fragment is really an example of some other, right? So on, for that sentence, there's a single occasion to reframe. But if I'm not mistaken, Michael did a large chunk of the reframing, right? I mean, literally sitting there day after day, right? And once that was done, once the initial reframing happened where it was needed, then, you know, we were far along. That must have been in year five or something. I can't remember. Uh, depends. depends on whether you're counting from the beginning of FrameNet 1 or the beginning of FrameNet 2. No, from the beginning of FrameNet 1. Yes, it's about five years. Right, so it was five years in when we understood, wait a minute, we're all about sense distinction. We really need to distinguish senses. But once that was done, then... Uh, we were more careful about how we divided things up from, from the outset. But, you know, you only learn because of the mistakes you make. Yeah, Michael has a comment. Yeah, so, um, uh, yes, we, we reframe less often, but we still do it. Mm -hmm. um, we still need to do it. Um, not usually for the sort of systematic reasons mm -hmm. anymore, because we've figured out, I, I hope, we figured out most of the systematic uh, kinds of distinctions that we need to make. But uh, every frame is different. Right. And, uh, you know, any day, you know, I could look at a frame that we've had sitting around for years and, uh, you know, some of those frames have not got a lot of annotation. I'm trying to annotate a new sentence tomorrow and I say, you know, I don't think this works. And then like everything could change and I could have to reframe everything. So reframing lets us remain flexible and uh, you know, lets us actually do our work because then you can make a frame uh, and get some work done even if you know, you're sure, even if you're sure that things are gonna change later on. I, right. did, I did just wanna make one more comment though. But apropos uh, of that, it was close to 30 years before Fillmore and Friends got commercial transaction right. Likewise, close to 30 years, maybe a little less, before Risk and its neighbors were worked out. Right. So that's the kind of thing that makes me really happy and Chuck is less happy. <laughs> he's happy that it's worked out, but he's not happy that it took so long. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so one final comment. Uh, uh, Eli, uh, if you were commenting that we don't actually have all three frames mm -hmm. in the case of break, that's true. Uh, because uh, the sentences of the assignment of yesterday yeah. uh -huh. has many examples that frame that, that would belong in a frame. Similar to this, <coughs> my, leg, in a frame. my leg broken, my leg is broken, right. I so, broke in my leg. Mm -hmm. Right, so they would, some of the sentences that you looked at yesterday would actually be annotated in a, a frame or other frames that FrameNet doesn't yet have. When I talk about FrameNet in 
public, especially you know, one off lecture, you know, at a conference for 20 minutes or half an hour, and someone asks, um, have you done the whatever frame? I say, not yet. Not yet. Right? Or uh, in the early days, uh, FrameNet got asked, uh, how many frames are you going to do? <laughs> OK. You know, people who understand what the um, enterprise is about would not ask the question, right? I mean, in theory, we could have a single frame for every single separate word. OK, we could do that. But how useful is uh, a FrameNet-like lexical resource going to be if that's what is done? Not, right? OK. OK, yeah. Well, I, I don't know if it's a simple question, but uh, it might be a yes or no question. OK. Um, can I say that when FrameNet decided to split the, fr um, the initial um, uh, blast frame into three? The, the initial frame, what frame? The block, the oh, noise, noise. Uh, the noise. Uh, sorry. Well, many more than three. I think we ended up with five. Uh, yeah, it was more like five, but yeah. Okay. Uh, d d uh, so can I say that FrameNet started taking into account something like Leonard Tolmy, Tolmy's, Tolmy's on force semantics, force dynamics, mm -hmm. force dynamics. Yes. Yeah. To some extent. Yeah. I mean, Len Tolmy's work is all about semantics, and so. Uh, we would be foolish were we not to take Len's work into consideration. In the example that you're uh, mentioning, the car blasted down the track or something, yeah, that's a good example of uh, force, dyna force dynamics uh, at play. And Michael has something to say. Um. Well, first of all, uh, we, we've certainly been aware of uh, Len Tolmy's work the whole time. So, you know, it, it wasn't like, uh, you know, uh, we, we rolled out of bed and said, uh, yeah, we've heard of Len Tolmy, but screw it. Um, uh, so, uh, no, so, I mean, basically, the qu there's always a question of at what level do you do your modeling? So, um, earlier in the FrameNet process, we assumed that more of these distinctions could be done constructionally. Hmm. And uh, the assumption was usually that it could be done by a productive construction. In other words, uh, and that, let's take, for example, the past participle, which can be used for statives. Um, so uh, frozen, for example, can be the state uh, that results from freezing, right? There are many, many verbs that work that way, where there's a verb that's a causative verb or an encoded verb, either one, and then there's a past participle which is used for the state. But it doesn't work for everything. In English, at least, it doesn't. It appears to work for everything in German. So actually, you would see something different if you looked at the Salsa project, uh, which did frames for German, because they didn't make the state of frames in most cases because there were no lexical units to put there because there was a productive process that you would, in other words, there's, there's actually a construction that produces uh, a state of frame, a state of semantics from something which is a causative. But in English, things like killed, killed does not work as a state of adjective. In, in English. So you, you cannot take an arbitrary causative verb and produce a state of adjective from it. It's, even though it's extremely common, it's actually lexically specific and lexically idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. And under those conditions, we didn't have anything better to do than to actually split it and say that these are separate frames. Uh, Let me suggest 